Good afternoon everyone and welcome to this Valentine's Day themed live Q&A with me, Professor Michael Scott. It's a great pleasure to have you uh, with uh, me this afternoon and thank you very much for tuning in. I hope you're having a good Valentine's Day so far. And we've had some uh, fun questions coming in over the last uh, week or so thinking about Valentine's and one of the things you guys uh, have all been asking about is kind of what are the origins of Valentine's Day? Does it have anything to do with the ancient Greeks and Romans? Yes, it does, as it always does, as it always should do. Valentine's Day is very much to do with uh, the Romans in this case and to do with the early Christian church. Hello Willow, hello Pedro, how are you doing? Lovely to see you, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I hope you're having a great sunny Thursday. It's beautiful sunshine spilling across London today and I hope there is with you as well. So, Valentine's Day, where does it come from and what's it got to do with the Romans? Now this is a complicated story because we actually have to weave two different things entirely. One is, who is this Valentine person, Saint Valentine, and the other is why is it celebrated and why is he celebrated and why is the Festival of Love and Affection celebrated around February the 14th. And these two things are somewhat separate and there are multiple versions of each of these stories. Hello James, hello Debbie, how are you doing? Happy Valentine's Day everyone. Um, there are multiple versions of all of these stories with the legends and the mysteries and the sources are all quite complex to try and work out. But something like this. There was uh, a Roman priest, it was said, uh, called uh, Valentine, who uh, in the, the third century AD, under the Emperor Claudius II, who had banned marriage because he felt that marriage made men into bad soldiers, because it meant they had loyalties elsewhere. Under that ban of marriage, Valentine decided this was not uh, the right way to proceed, and so used to uh, perform marriages in secret. And when he was found out, as the story goes, he was imprisoned, thrown in jail and sentenced to death. Now, then there are some confusing extras which might be slightly separate traditions or might be part of the same tradition that he seemingly fell in love with his jailer's daughter. And uh, as he was taken to be executed, he sent her a love letter that, in some sources, uh, talks about uh, him signing off saying, from your Valentine. So that's one set of stories. Hello Isabel, happy doing. Hello Susie, hello to do with who is this Valentine guy. But why is he celebrated and why is it celebrated, particularly as the Festival of Love, around February the 14th? We have to go back to the Romans because around February the 14th, indeed the very next day on February the 15th, that is the Ides of the Roman month of February. And that was the centre point of a Roman festival called the Lupercalia. Now, this was a, a festival all dedicated to fertility, to the god Faunus, the god of agriculture, uh, and it was associated with the beginning of springtime. Hello, Latifa, how are you doing? Lovely to see you. Um, the, so the Lupercalia uh, was a festival of uh, celebration of fertility in which Equally in Rome, some very odd things were going on. The Romans actually enjoyed having quite odd society turning head over heels kind of activities happening during their festivals. And in the Lupercalia, there would be a set of Roman priests who would make sacrifices uh, in the cave, uh, supposedly associated with where Romulus and Remus, the founders of Rome, were suckled by wolf. But there would also be particularly young men who were dressed up in a sort of odd wolfish-like costume and they were given strips of goat skin and they were allowed to uh, head out and whip uh, women around about the city of Rome and elsewhere. Now what was going on here is that the women felt that if they were touched by these these threads of, of goat skin that they would uh, be blessed with fertility for that year. So you have to imagine this big festival at Rome where these people run running around with these threads of goat skin uh, whipping everyone with women actually quite enjoying and wanting to be touched in this way to ensure their fertility for the coming year. So we have this Roman uh, festival of the Lupercalia associated with fertility definitively happening around mid-February, February the 15th. And then in the 5th century CE, when Rome had converted to Christianity and the early Christian church was seeking how ways of ensuring the new Christian festivals were well embedded and easily taken on by the still relatively recent pagan population of Rome, 
as they did, if you remember when we were talking about festivals to do with Christmas, <laughs> um, they sought to overlap the Lupercalia with a festival uh, as a celebration of, and they were looking around for someone good uh, to focus a Christian saint-like figure that they could focus uh, that, that festival on, St Valentine. So that's why we have St Valentine coming into the picture and why he's then being celebrated around about February the 14th. Um, indeed, in, and then in some later versions of the story, he was uh, actually sentenced to death on the 14th of February as well. So it all kind of neatly eventually ties together with the first Valentine's Day supposedly being celebrated at the very end of the 5th century CE in 496. So there we go, Valentine's Day, a very old festival in some ways and a very new festival in others um, that only in late years from the Middle Ages onwards really started taking on all the connotations that we have today of it being the day to express love and affection to your loved ones around you. Um, and indeed it's from, uh, I think, about uh, the 1500s, something like that, that we have our first surviving Valentine's love letter. Um, but it's all again down to the Romans. Hello, Miriam. Hello, Sabina. Hello, Patricia. How are you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you so much for joining in for this Valentine's Day Q&A. So there you've got it. You've got uh, the Valentine's Day, where Valentine's Day comes from. Thank you very much for your questions on that. There's also been some questions coming in to do with, uh, you know, how did the ancients think about and understand love, uh, you know, the concept of love. And this is particularly to do with the ancient Greek world. So we go a bit further back than the Romans, the ancient Greeks. It was uh, a, an interesting and varied spectrum. Love was never just one thing. Um, and famously, the Greeks used uh, four different words to describe different kinds of love. So there was uh, eros, which was the, the, the passionate sexual attraction, the rather dangerous love where you were completely out of control. Um, there was philia, and that uh, translates more as kind of love, friendship, deep friendship and, and, and connection between two people that can be, uh, is normally not uh, in any way of a, uh, it's a dispassionate love, if you like, a, a philosophical love, uh, a, a moral love, however you might want to describe it. Isabel, ancients believed in true love from the heart. Oh, a nice way of thinking about it, yeah, um, philia is that sort of sense of it, um, of having a very deep soulful uh, connection between people, as opposed to eros, which can sweep in and you have the image of those little cupid figures, the, the figure of eros, um, of desire, um, sweeping in and, and the kind of idea that eros hit you, it was a, almost a disease that afflicted you, think about Aphrodite, the goddess of love, striking people with eros that made them do things completely beyond their control, supposedly indeed even Heaven, the story of Troy, kind of she was struck uh, with desire for Paris as much as anything else, or at least later claimed that that was the case. Um, and you always see those Cupid figures going around with an arrow, a bow and an arrow, striking you with the passion that's, uh, that's uh, coming to you from outside. Hello, Rajarupa. Hello, Julia. How are you doing? Thank you so much for joining in the Q&A on the Valentine's Day. And do shout with your questions now on the live feed as well if you've got any other questions that come to mind as we're talking about Valentine's Day themes of love and affection. So yes, we had eros and we had philia, um, that's the two of the Greek words, one to describe the sexual side of attraction, the other the, the dispassionate, deeper, uh, soulful love. And then the other two, uh, agape, uh, is another word which kind of is, is sort of a familial affection, it's a sort of feeling that one might have for your children or uh, for your spouse, but equally and increasingly as these words start to be used in uh, kind of Christian context, early Christian writings, um, for love of God uh, and for the divine. So we've got, uh, we've got philia, we've got eros, we've got agape, and then there is storge, uh, which doesn't sound particularly good, does it? As a term, doesn't really sound a very good word to use to describe your affections. Um, but this is very much that kind of idea of of empathy or the feeling as the parents might have for their children um, as they are kind of uh, that, that understanding and empathy and love that comes uh, uh, um, and, 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 and seeks to take place kind of despite difficulties that may be happening within the relationship um, but which is an overarching context uh, in which that relationship endures. So there you go, you've got Eros, you've got Philia, 
you've got agape and you've got stodge. There you go, the ways in which the ancient Greeks thought about and divided up, if you like, the spectrum of love um, as they looked around them uh, and, 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 and engaged with their wider world. So there we have it, the uh, kind of a great question coming in about the nature of love uh, in the ancient Greek world. A couple of things um, that have come up, take a break from some questions um, and uh, come back to uh, some, some Q&A, uh, some, some classics in the news. I was amazed by this, I don't know what you think about this, but there was an article in the Telegraph saying that an Oxford University classics degree is going, they're thinking of overhauling the curriculum because they've come across this amazing statistic a very worrying statistic, uh, which is that um, in Oxford University Classics degree, 46.8% of men, men taking the degree achieved the top grade in their finals year compared to 12.5% of their female peers. So I think the first question is, how do we go about understanding that kind of data set? And what do we then do about it? And is it a question? Daisy Dunn, as you may have seen, was writing um, in the uh, newspapers just recently saying she didn't think it was a question actually of overhauling the curriculum, simply teaching something different isn't going to change um, the nature of uh, who is getting more uh, firsts or better marks, but that actually a wider, more holistic approach has to be taken to be thinking about how the degree is set up, how the teaching is done, how is it examined, um, and uh, how those different skill sets that are required for those different forms of examination respond to what we know um, is uh, traditionally kind of um, wider studies, um, stronger areas of performance uh, for men versus women. So lots to be thinking about there, but I, I guess Oxford Classics might just be the tip of the iceberg. I wonder how many other degree programmes uh, for classics and indeed for other subjects have been have looked at these sorts of stats um, and chosen to respond to them and gone so public about them as well. Uh, kind of, uh, oh no, you can't hear me. Oh dear. Yeah, Isabel, you can't hear me. Let's see if we can turn it up a little bit. Can you hear me now? I'm hoping you can hear me now, indeed. Let me know, Isabel, if you can't hear anything. This is terrible news. Um, fingers crossed that you can hear it now. Let us know. Um, yes, so we were discussing about uh, the Oxford Classics a revelation that uh, such a vast majority of the male students taking their degree course um, are uh, getting the top grades compared to a much smaller percentage of the female students taking the same course so kind of we need to think about what this is what this is uh, what might be the reasons in the round for it and then we need to be responding to and thinking about that indeed right Nassim you can hear me Claire can hear me James uh, James can hear me Isabel fingers crossed that you can find the right button to be able to press um, but yeah do send your thoughts in uh, as to uh, what you think might affect and, and cause those kind of different differences in the studies uh, for undergraduate degrees, um, that a seemingly extraordinary difference uh, between uh, the two uh, sexes. Uh, Isabel, oh no, you still can't hear. Well, yeah, Debbie is much better. Okay, well, fingers crossed that continues. What else has been going on in the news? Oh, I wanted to um, bring to your attention that, uh, we'll put a, a post out about this on the Facebook page, that uh, FutureLearn, which is a, a company that runs online courses that you can subscribe to and the Future Learn works at the British Library um, in central London. And their course, uh, which is to do with the virtual Rome, it's getting to know the city of Rome through a virtual tour and learning about the city through a virtual world of Rome, which has been constructed and, and is curated by uh, Matthew uh, Nichols, who's based at Reading University, who was also a National Teaching Fellowship winner at the same time, same year I was a, a, an NTF winner um, in 2017. Uh, absolutely fantastic uh, course to take um, and definitely recommend you, if you've got a spare moment or two, inscribing and running along with the future Learn course, you can do it as and when you like, all online. That course is starting in March. Um, so if you go to Future Learn and have a look for that, uh, then you'll be able to see Rome a virtual tour. Um, and the other great thing that's come out of the uh, uh, the the Fitzwilliam uh, Museum um, is the announcement of uh, a three-year major three-year project 
to do with islands, art and identity of the larger Mediterranean islands. Um, and uh, that's kind of it. So Willow, you did half on the last round of the Rome Virtual Future Learn course. You said it was really good. Good, okay, I hope you're gonna finish the other half this time round. What a great idea that you can do half now and half on the next iteration. So if you haven't got the whole time, uh, all the time to do the whole course this time, you can do it across two years. Um, Catherine's a big fan of Future Learn courses. Hello, Anthony, how are you doing? Thank you so much for joining. Um, yes, so the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge is going to be running a major project to do with art and identity of uh, the a larger Mediterranean islands. And that's going to culminate in a couple of years time in a major exhibition at the museum to do with island life, art and identity on Mediterranean islands. So that sounds like it's gonna be absolutely fantastic. Um, and uh, then also in the spirit of Valentine's Day, I wonder how, kind of how long it took them to work out when to schedule this, but it turns out yesterday was International Condom Day yesterday. Um, and you may have seen, I had it on my Twitter feed, um, that Edith Hall, another great classicist, had responded to this to International Condom Day by um, uh, tweeting a picture of different packets of condoms that have been given at one point or another classical names. Um, and you may be well uh, versed in some of these. Uh, I remember, I mean, I certainly had heard of some of them. Um, Trojan uh, is kind of one, there's a brand that you still see around recently, although as Edith pointed out, as many people pointed out in response to her tweets, um, it's not exactly uh, the kind of connotations of the brand might not be exactly what they were after as the, the gift of the horse that gets taken inside but turns out to be full of the enemy. I'm not quite sure kind of whether that's exactly what they were going for in their branding uh, but Edith was also talking about different brands of, of condoms in the past that have been called things like Sphinx. Again, <laughs> as an odd half animal, half one thing, half the other. I'm not quite sure whether that sums it up in the way that you might want. Um, and then my personal favourite, there was a brand of condom apparently at one point called Spartan. And again, I'm not sure if uh, you want uh, your condoms to be Spartan or indeed any kind of uh, connotation of Spartanness uh, in uh, your uh, kind of what you bring to the bedroom. So there we go, International Condom Day just yesterday with uh, even the classical world gets even there um, into the branding of, uh, of contraception. So, uh, and that takes us back rather neatly to a couple more questions that have been coming in to do with our Valentine's theme now. I, uh, <laughs> yes, indeed, Miriam goes, ouch, ouch. <laughs> Quite indeed, thank you very much, yes. Uh, now, these next two questions, uh, I have to uh, have a proviso that uh, they come, come with a warning, uh, an uh, over 18s only warning. So if you're uh, under 18 at the moment, please turn off the sound for a moment or two and we'll get back to you, come back in a minute or two. Um, but this was a question from Alexandra Sills who was asking about the Aristophanes, uh, Greek, ancient Greek comedy, particularly the Lysistrata, which is a hilarious play in which the women of Athens decide to withhold sex from the men of Athens until, frankly, they get it together, stop being idiots, stop the war, uh, which is ravaging the city, um, and just be a bit more sensible. Um, and during the course of their discussions about how they're going to withhold uh, sex from men, their men and how that's going to completely um, turn men's heads and force them to uh, do what the women want. There is the description of uh, lion on a cheese grater. Now, uh, Alexandra Sills uh, asks, kind of, in terms of this is clearly a description of some kind of sexual position, uh, but what in heaven's name is uh, acting like a lion or a lioness on a cheese grater. Um, you could have a look at some, and I think it's well worth it, it's absolutely hilarious, looking at some of the great scholarly commentaries of uh, this line of Aristophanes Lysistrata, lioness on a cheese grater, um, and see what some of the scholars in typically scholastic academic language try to make of this, um, particularly uh, people like Alan Summerstein. Um, so that's worth having a look at, having a Google online. Um, but in terms of what it is, um, if you uh, were seeking to replicate uh, this or any other position offered from ancient Greece, the lion on a cheese grater has been described either as uh, a, uh, a woman on top of a man, rocking backwards and forth, forwards, 
or indeed, uh, and here is the big academic division and in the debate, it's either that or it is uh, a uh, standing uh, position in which the man is behind the woman, entering her from behind, a uh, sort of uh, standing doggy position as it might be described. So there you go, you uh, can have to make up your mind in the big academic debate of the 21st century over um, lioness on a cheese grater. Is it uh, one or the other of the two options that I've described? Um, I think uh, answers perhaps not uh, to the Facebook page but if you want to send an email in about it please do um, and thank you very much Alexandra Sills for uh, asking that question absolutely perfect um, to be answering on Valentine's Day um, and then we also had a question in also from Mark Barros um, who was asking more widely about sexual orientation and, and sex um, both heterosexual and homosexual sex uh, within the ancient Greek world and, and what was the Greek attitude to Towards it. Um, and I think it's very, very important because uh, very often the ancient Greek ex exemplar gets utilised and misrepresented to support arguments um, in our own cultures about attitudes towards particular sexual orientations. And that's incredibly difficult really to, to substantiate because to understand attitudes towards sex in the ancient Greek world, um, I'm not blushing, Chad. no, 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 I'm not blushing at all as I try and sit here and discuss sexual positions via a Facebook Live Q&A at all. Um, kind of, if we're thinking about um, attitudes towards sex in the ancient Greek world, it's really important that we actually sweep aside the categorizations that we use in the modern world. Alexandra Sills, thank you, you'd been wondering, thank you, <laughs> I'm so glad <laughs> that uh, we could answer your question to some satisfaction um, on this Q&A, uh, live Q&A with me, Professor Michael Scott, and uh, yes indeed, that certainly uh, is a first um, for me answering that kind of question uh, on live, uh, live broadcast. So uh, going back to more wider questions of sexual orientation, so we have to sweep aside the spectrum of um, what we use today to divide uh, people's kind of sexual orientation into they may be heterosexual, they may be homosexual, they may be bisexual, etc. Um, those kind of distinct categories didn't really exist in the ancient Greek world. In fact, sexual orientation or kind of who you choose, whom you chose to have sex with really um, mattered in the ancient Greek world, depending on what age you were. Uh, and particularly for men, uh, this was, there was an idea that as you progressed through your life, different kinds of sexual relationships were appropriate at different stages in your life. Um, so you, uh, when you were young and sort of in your early teens in the ancient Greek world, if you're a man, then you were supposed to engage in a, what we would describe as homosexual relationship with an older man, the so-called Erastes, a Romanos relationship. And that was considered to be an exchange of both youthful beauty and older wisdom, uh, which may or may not have been uh, sexual in nature, in terms of sexual acts in nature, um, depending on the particular couple. But as uh, a man got older uh, and got into his 20s, then that was very much supposed to stop. And a man was supposed to then do his uh, wider duty, as it were, to continue the citizen population by turning to take a wife um, and then to have children. And then later on in life, kind of then might turn into the older partner in that um, Erastes of Romanos relationship. Now, this is the sort of sexual um, trajectory, if you like, that one can imagine in Athens. Um, but uh, it would be different in, in many of the different Greek city-states. The, the ages would vary. Um, the uh, nature of the relationships would vary. The longevity of those relationships, what was expected of you, would vary um, as the different social kind of groupings varied across each different city-state. <coughs> so back in Athens, France, instance, we know that there was a law that if you weren't married by a certain age, um, uh, you were fined. Um, it give you that instance of how society stepped in to insist that people did certain things at certain stages in their life because of the importance of that process and then the begetting of children to the continuation of the community within a society that and, and, and health conditions and living conditions where we estimate that every, every, fa every couple would need to be having three plus children just to be able to keep the population numbers stable because of the high rate of infant mortality happening at something like 25%. So kind of within that context, you have to see kind of sexual orientation, sexual choices within the wider context of actually the survival and continuity of the community. 
Um, women, interesting question from Ruth. Did women go through a similar prayer process? Um, not in the same way. There was not considered to be a moment in which women were supposed to have a relationship with an older woman in the same way as a man. Um, they were very much instead supposed to remain uh, chaste um, and uh, as virgins until they were taken as brides um, to be uh, to be married and to be part of her, their new husband's household. Um, but that doesn't stop in, uh, for example, Greek tragedy. And if you look in Greek vase painting, that doesn't stop at all. Uh, men thinking about, worrying about, imagining that women are not only sex mad and much kind of keener and much and more able to enjoy the sexual act than men, um, but that um, they, given half a chance, they would go off and do lots of uh, things with women as well. So there's this very uh, interesting kind of dynamic in which uh, men are thinking about and, and, and setting up for themselves an idea that women may be going off um, doing sorts of things and that in, in that they were not supposed to be doing, um, that were very much then akin to uh, what uh, men were doing at certain stages in their lives. So there we go, a kind of a, a, a quick, po quick potted history um, of uh, or sexual uh, or ideas of sexual orientation uh, within the ancient Greek world. And Miriam, I wonder how much was attributed to balance of the humours in ancient medicine? Um, I, I mean, lots to do with ancient humours, lots of different ideas surrounding uh, the balance of the humours and indeed relating that to sex and to organs of the body. Um, so, uh, for example, in some of the early medical texts to do with women, uh, it was kind of uh, thought that if a woman had something wrong with her, um, then actually prescribing sex, that regular sexual intercourse, was one way of um, helping them back to good health, uh, whereas for men it was often uh, to be prescribed an enema. Uh, but uh, kind of equally, it was considered at certain points that certain organs in women like the womb would move around the body and clamp onto and attach themselves to other organs within the body, and that could cause different medical conditions and problems for, um, for the woman again. So yes, it kind of actually sex, sexual intercourse, uh, the reproductive organs were all then associated with ideas of um, how one understood illness in the ancient world, particularly for women, and how one actually then prescribed treatments for that. Um, kind of, uh, there we go, uh, kind of lots and lots of things to be thinking about, but um, absolutely fantastic, and thank you very much for your questions. We are running out of time. Uh, it's a Valentine's Day Q&A, which has gone from um, issues of well, who, what was Valentine's Day, to themes about great love, to the nitty gritty of sexual uh, intercourse um, and the discussion of particular positions to wider discussions of sexual orientation. Um, kind of, wow, kind of, we've really covered some ground today. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining and asking your great question. Absolutely, kind of, Nikki asking where Freud took some of his ideas. Yes, very much coming out of the Greek philosophers um, and other philosophers as well, kind of thinking about these issues, which have recurred not just in ancient Greek society, but in a number of early societies, these similar ideas keep popping up uh, and moving forward. Um, I just wanted to flag with you again, of course, that next week, uh, is the week of my professorial inaugural lecture at the University of Warwick and uh, we are going to be uh, not doing a Q&A on the Thursday the 21st so there won't be a Q&A next Thursday at four o'clock. Instead if you remember my professorial inaugural lecture is going to be shown live or as a Facebook live event on Wednesday the 20th kicking off just after 5 p.m. So we will probably go live to show some of the introductory material um, from uh, some of the speakers at the University of Warwick who are introducing me, and then my lecture will go live about 5.15. And uh, just a reminder that you can ask questions as I'm talking live in the lecture because the uh, Facebook live feed will be overseen by our Warwick Classics Network fellow, uh, Paul Grigsby, and he will be making a note of your questions and who has asked them. And then at the end of the lecture, there's going to be a Q&A session in the room and we will be taking questions both from people in the room with us, uh, in the audience, but also uh, those that you've asked over the Q&A. So please do, as you're listening to the lecture and questions come to you, ask them then and there 
on the feed and they will be noted down and then they'll go into the pot that Paul will be choosing from to put forward a couple of those questions in the live Q&A so I get a chance to answer your questions as well. So this great idea um, that this lecture, the inaugural lecture, is going to be a truly a global live lecture, breaking through the physical boundaries of the university and very much, please, please, please um, ask your questions um, in the normal way uh, via the live feed as the lecture's going on because it'd be great to have your thoughts. Let us know your name, where you're listening from um, and uh, also your question. Thank you so much. Uh, Nikki, we will get to your question next time because we're running out of time now. Um, but thank you so much for joining us, everyone. We've got some great questions and we will be back the week after next with our normal Thursday Q&A. So that'll be on the 28th of February. Um, but a reminder, next week, Wednesday the 20th, February 5 p.m. Join me for my professorial inaugural lecture. I'll be in a big gown and a silly hat um, and, and hopefully uh, you'll enjoy hearing uh, some thoughts that I have about the future of how we should be teaching classics in universities, um, what we should be teaching, whom we should be teaching it to and how we can really how harness the power of the university to work with the local community and the wider national community to spread the love of our and our, our the love of, of the ancient world and our understanding of it thank you very much all indeed have a great rest of the week have a lovely valentine's day happy valentine's day to you all 2019 um, and sending much love to you all take care all the best